hopefully are aligning with some other CASA state organizations doing virtual conference opportunities. And I pre-recorded this webinar because I wanted to make sure that there wasn't any technology glitches. So the content will be recorded and then I'll come back on afterwards and we'll do a Q&A um, throughout the, the content. Please, please, please put in the chat box if you have any questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and switch my screen here. Hmm. This is where those technology glitches come into play. All right, so what I would like for you to do is we'll get a little bit of engagement in the chat while I figure this out. Would you be so kind as to put in the chat box what you would like to learn tonight? It doesn't have to be anything super specific, um, just what you wanna learn. And let me know, can you now see a, a screen with me on it? Perfect. All right, I'm gonna stop my video and I'm gonna start the content. Hello, I'm so excited you are here. So this is actually pre-recorded. Um, today is Sunday. September 27th. Uh, the reason that we wanted to pre-record this was to prevent any technology glitches. As you know, there's many Zoom meetings, many virtual meetings that are taking place, and we wanted to ensure that you receive the best content with hopefully everything going incredibly smoothly. This is our first webinar for our State of Awareness uh, virtual conference series. And we're, we're so excited for you to be here. This is a new endeavor for us, and we hope that it is as valuable as possible for you. And I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So if you are in the right place, uh, this is a webinar titled Living a Trauma-Informed Life. My name is Kelly Schwartz, and I work for Wisconsin CASA Association. Um, just a quick introduction here, and these are rhetorical questions, but when we think about trauma-informed care or even living a trauma-informed life, how does that bring you here? You know, what do you hope to learn and possibly accomplish by listening to this webinar? Just take a moment and think, you know, for me personally, um, as I'm presenting this content, I hope to learn how to be a better facilitator because I'm literally talking to a screen with no feedback. Um, so just think about what you would like to accomplish and learn from this, this webinar. All right, real quick, um, who, who am I? I am, I work for Wisconsin CASA Association and I believe I am coming up on three years and before that I was in the corporate world. Um, didn't really find a lot of kind of mission or even my happy bubble. I really wanted to have my daily job be something where I knew that I was making a difference. So here I am. Um, this past summer, through a virtual training, it was through St. A, which if you notice on the PowerPoint screens, there are two logos. There is the Wisconsin CASA, the Wisconsin Court Appointed Special Advocates logo on your bottom left and then the St. A's logo on your bottom right. This training is a portion 
and I say a portion very lightly, of the seven essential ingredients of being trauma-informed. Um, we are going to expand this training and it will basically be continuing education opportunities for you as advocates, for you as staff, for you as community members, um, for you as people who care about children. So that will be coming down the line. Um, and then, you know, in the state of Wisconsin, I'm sure if you are a staff person for CASA, if you are an advocate, you're very familiar with the pre-service training. Um, I'm lucky enough in the state of Wisconsin to be able to facilitate the pre-service training curriculum. A quick overview. Uh, this is a very very high level overview of what we will be accomplishing today. We'll go through some logistics. We will talk about trauma. We'll talk about resilience. We'll discuss some trends. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting to hear and see what's occurring kind of outside of our own personal bubbles. So I, I hope you'll be uh, in, as enamored as I am with trends. And then we'll also talk about some data points and hopefully give you guys some takeaways that are really meaningful and tangible. With the uh, logistics for today, because we are on a Zoom webinar, there really isn't a lot of opportunity for um, vocal engagement from you. What I would like for you to do is if you have any questions, to please put them in the chat box. We will be having a Q&A later in this presentation, and I would love to hear your questions. Uh, hopefully we can get to all of them. If not, I will certainly follow up with some resources and answers and whatnot. So please feel free put anything in the chat box. Remember that there is a capability of if you send it directly to me, I am your host, or you can send it to everybody. It doesn't matter, whatever you are most comfortable with. And then also, I will be sharing and showing many videos and referencing a couple of resources. So after this presentation, uh, it'll probably be Wednesday morning. As an attendee, you will receive an email with the links to those videos, resources referenced, and then also a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. And in addition to a survey, which I would love to hear your feedback. So remember, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. I won't be monitoring the chat box too much during most of the presentation, but I will be taking notes as, as you know, this is a, a pre-recorded webinar. All right, so I'm sure many of you noticed that this is a, actually a caution symbol. And the reason that we put this up there is because the discussion of trauma, the discussion of adversity, oftentimes can bring up thoughts of our own personal experiences. And sometimes this is uncomfortable. And while it's normal and necessary to acknowledge our own trauma, it, it can get really heavy. So. I want to preface this presentation and content with if you need to step out, if you need to take a break, uh, please do what you are most comfortable with. I want you to feel, feel like you are in a safe enough space where we can sit with a little bit of discomfort and possibly grow from that discomfort. Um, so if you know, you need to take a break, please feel free to do so. I don't think a lot of this is um, anything that you as an advocate or you as a staff person haven't heard or seen, but certainly with trauma, we know that triggers occur. Um, so moving on to probably one of the most important couple slides is our, our learning objectives. So 
and I'm not going to read these slides to you. Basically, what I would like for you to do is come away with a purpose of why you are doing what you are doing. Either being an advocate, being a staff person, being a community member, being a mom, being a dad, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle. I feel like trauma informed is so ingrained in who we are that it doesn't necessarily need to apply to our jobs or our advocacy. It can be in our daily living. Um, there will be a couple techniques that I talk about and then follow up with that will really help you enhance your connection with those in your life that have been affected by trauma. In addition, I want you to be motivated to basically enhance your services to those that you love and those that you serve. Um, and then the last learning objective here, and it's, it's highlighted in this presentation pretty consistently, is to recognize that historical and intergenerational trauma and equity are absolutely central. They are critical to understanding trauma for all people. So now that we have gone through all of our learning objectives, I'd like for you to take a moment and just think about what you feel trauma is. As an advocate, we certainly talk about trauma a lot in our training. We talk a lot about trauma in, you know, your day-to-day -day advocacy. If you're not a CASA advocate, if you are a board member, if you are a stakeholder, just take a moment and think about possibly yourself, possibly somebody that you love or consider a friend. What trauma have they experienced? You know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the reason why we're doing a virtual conference series right now is because of a global pandemic. And on some level, is that trauma for our kids? Is that trauma for many of our Americans? So that brings me to probably my favorite part. Um, just because it's so data-driven and it's really difficult to deny. What are the trends of trauma-informed care? This is a really difficult thing to acknowledge. Um, Dr. Stephen Sharfstein actually put out a, uh, a journal article talking about how trauma is to mental health as smoking is to cancer. So trauma is to mental health as smoking is to cancer. So he's making a pretty powerful statement about the importance of mental health and basically inviting all of us to consider just how important trauma is to our work and in our everyday lives. So David Brooks is a journalist from the New York Times and um, for lack of a better term, you know, somebody who is what we would consider a community member might not necessarily be, you know, have gone through trauma-informed training so he put together a quote. It was part of one of his articles. And I would like for you to take a moment and just close your eyes as I read aloud his statement. When you look over the domestic policy landscape, you see all these different people in different policy silos with different budgets in healthcare, education, crime, poverty, social mobility, and labor force issues. But in their disjointed ways, they are all dealing with the same problem, that across vast stretches of America, economic, social, and family breakdowns are producing enormous amounts of stress and unregulated behavior, which dulls motivation, undermines self-control, and distorts lives. 
Maybe it's time for people in all these different fields to get together in a room and make a concerted push against the psychological barriers to success. Okay, you can open your eyes. So, because we live in this world, because we work in this world, you might suggest that, um, you know, social workers and psychologists believe that trauma is a big deal. But here's a journalist, and he actually is becoming a advocate of trauma-informed care, suggesting that this is really a big deal. And he is imploring us to understand and come together and make a difference. So trends. Um, there is a lawsuit in Compton, uh, Compton, California. I believe it was initially filed in 2015, and it's a federal class action arguing that schools should actually be mandated to program for students with trauma similar to those with disabilities. Right now, I believe that lawsuit is on hold, um, and if you want further reading about that, I'll send a couple resources, but all you really have to do is Google lawsuit in Compton trauma and videos pop up, news articles pop up. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon. And I believe there are a couple other states, um, or school districts and states that are taking up the, a similar issue. So then when we talk about the medical community, um, stress and inflammation on the body. When trauma happens, a growing body of evidence in the medical community is basically stating that overwhelming stress leads to inflammation and a plethora of medical outcomes. Um, primarily, many of them are not positive. Another one is workforce issues and trauma. Employers are starting to recognize that trauma-informed care is actually a pathway to better retention and actually better productivity in their staff. And then last but not least, politics. Um, I know you probably saw that word, and especially right now in our climate, many of you probably gawked. Um, but this is actually a positive because right now there are politicians who are starting to recognize the connection between trauma-informed care and human capital. So it's, it's really incredible to hear in all of these separate instances that there are many disciplines, many groups that are actually connecting the fact that trauma-informed care is a big deal. So I'm going to pause this really quick and just do a, a little intro of this video. Uh, this was part of a news article that CNN put together in regards to the lawsuit in Compton. Drug dealing, murder, poverty, and gangster rap. Straight out of Compton, Hollywood's version of this Los Angeles neighborhood. Compton is still troubled. Its murder rate is five times that of the national average. And these two Compton teenagers say the film reflects their reality. They shooting daytime, nighttime, kids, moms, parents, grandpas. They don't care. He and his brother say they've seen the results of that violence in terrifying detail. I was coming back home from school and this Hispanic guy. I had an African-American guy on his knees, and he just blew his head off. How did you react to it? I was doing a fight for like three hours. I've seen somebody get shot. I've seen somebody get dragged across a field and got hit in the head with the back of a shotgun and then dragged into somebody else. It was a group of people outside, and nobody did nothing. After regularly witnessing such violence, the boys say they were still expected to learn, just like everyone else in school, that is in possible according to a first of its kind class action lawsuit they are a part of these children are as a matter of brain science un 
able to learn. The lawsuit says the students who experience trauma should be classified as disabled, like children with autism. Its intent is to get Compton schools to provide more counselors and teacher training to recognize the damage trauma can do. The lawsuit cites studies showing trauma can effectively rewire a child's brain, making it hard for them to concentrate, memorize, or rationalize, causing them to overreact, have violent outbursts, or withdraw, so they are suspended and expelled more often than other students. There's a, a scientific case, a medical case to be made, that children that are exposed to significant amounts of adverse childhood experiences uh, are, are disabled. Dr. Robert Ross is the head of the California Endowment and a trained pediatrician. If you compare brain uh, tests, for example, uh, CAT scans of a brain, of two three-year-olds, one who's been exposed to a lot of trauma and abuse or neglect with a normal child, the brains look different. Five students and three teachers have joined the lawsuit. What does Compton Unified School District think about the lawsuit? We asked the president of the school board. The Compton Unified School District agrees that trauma within children must be addressed. So you okay, so where's the data? When, um, when I did my initial training with St. A's, they talked about the fact that there was a grant from the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, so here in the state of Wisconsin, to study what happens when child welfare workers become trauma-informed. Two case management teams actually received specialized training and implemented a case staffing protocol. And it required a kid-specific discussion with their supervisor about the significance of trauma and using these training materials. Their case outcomes were actually tracked for about two years and then compared to two other control team outcomes. And the results were pretty phenomenal. So here we have um, basically one of the most powerful outcomes from this study was the effect of trauma-informed practices on permanency outcomes. So basically the percentage of children who get reunified with their families, get placed with a relative as their legal guardian, or even get adopted by a family member of a non-family member. So the two treatment teams, um, the bar on the right, had almost twice the number of kids achieve permanency compared to their control team colleagues, which is the bar on the left. Uh, this data is another example of a vast, enormous, growing body of evidence suggesting that trauma-informed care actually does work. This was in 94. At this point, I was homeless, sleeping beneath a bridge, eating out of trash can. I couldn't go in anybody's house, including my mother's. Right here, I have, you can't really tell, two black guys in a busted left. Thank you for receiving us here in El Paso. Um, my name is Tony Arcane. I was molested, I was raped, I was raped, I was beaten, I was raped, and I was like, this is how it's supposed to be for me. I am nothing, I'm never gonna melt anything, and this is how it is, and you should, I'll stay here, I'll die just like this. And I had become comfortable with that.
here we have another example of why being trauma-informed can actually make a huge difference. All right, so think about back to when I asked you to picture yourself, to picture your CASA child, to picture your friend or your loved one, and what their trauma looks like or what trauma they've experienced. So there's three components to this trauma definition. And so first, it is a very difficult event. And it, it, it does have the potential to create trauma. Then what actually is trauma can become watered down. So, for example, your favorite sports team losing a game is probably not a traumatic event. Watching someone you care for get intentionally hurt to the point of needing medical care is much more likely to be a traumatic event. Although there's, um, there's a lot of individual differences and perspectives, the key is about harm or threat to in harm or threat to it harm. So the second is we suggest that trauma exposure, which is the event, is, difficult, is different than a trauma response, which is how somebody uh, responds to the event. So the good news is the majority of people who have exposure to traumatic events develop, don't develop a long-term trauma response, meaning they don't develop that, um, that, that response where it can ingrain itself in them. So realistically, that within itself is a testament to the power of support and resiliency. A person can witness or experience a traumatic event, but they can also receive support, they can receive care, they can receive comfort, they can receive professional help, and that can prevent the experience of that event from becoming a trauma response. So when we equate trauma, response, trauma exposure with trauma response, we run the risk of disrespecting that same resiliency and the role that families, friends, and communities can play to mitigate the effects of the exposure. And then the third component is difficulty in kind of day-to-day -day living generally occurs because of there's like this clash between what the brain and the body have been trained to do. So it's like that detect the threat. You always have to be vigilant, um, you know, maybe react with aggression to survive. So that intersects with society expectations of be calm, don't overreact, settle down, don't show your feelings. So it's difficult with these three criteria, but we encourage individuals to not use trauma unless all three of these have been met. So they've had the exposure, that exposure overwhelms that person's ability to respond in a productive way, and then those adaptations to that event create difficulty in daily living. So it's a lot to unpack. Um, I will send the PowerPoint after if you guys want to uh, continue reviewing this. And then I would, you know, with, with trauma typically comes resiliency, especially in the world that we are as CASA advocates and CASA staff is we pride ourselves in being that resilient person in these children's lives. So the definition of resilience 
is the ability of a child to recover and then show early and effective adaptations following a potentially traumatic event. So for children, what could resiliency look like? You know, after that event occurs, they respond with, you know, oh, not really a lot of distress, not a huge impact on their daily functioning, processing in a productive manner. And sometimes there might be a little bit of a dip in their ability to cope, but then it's followed with, you know, that child recognizes it and then they're able to return back to their typical level of functioning. So here we have a video on basically what I just talked about in a more condensed and scientific way um, that applies to children. So what does being trauma-informed and resilience-focused really mean? Being trauma-informed and resilience-focused is a mindset. It is the lens from which we look at kids. It is viewing kids from the perspective of what has happened to them or what is currently happening in their lives that is driving the way they are behaving. Being trauma-informed and resilience-focused is knowing that even despite life adversity that has happened or continues to happen, we have an opportunity to foster and, and cultivate characteristics of resilience in kids. Being trauma-informed and resilience-focused is always wondering, always being curious about the what happened, rather than labeling or diagnosing or thinking that we know everything about that child and why they're behaving the way they are. It is really, really asking ourselves, what about their experiences are driving what we see in front of us today? The other thing to remember about being trauma-informed and resilience-focused is that we are not just asking ourselves and thinking about the challenges and the problems, but we're looking at what is already right with kids. What are their strengths? What are their resources? What can we use to help them cope with what they've experienced? So when people ask me, how can I become more trauma-informed? What do I need to have in my classroom? What do I need to have in my office? While strategies, tools, resources can certainly be helpful, the most important thing for all of us to remember as practitioners is that being trauma-informed and resilience-focused starts with and ends with your mindset. It's the way we view kids. So when we talk about trauma, when we talk about resiliency, oftentimes that word stress comes up. And it comes up because I think as, as adults and professionals and community members, we acknowledge that we experience stress on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but if you look on the right here, you know, it's almost predictable, it's moderate, it's controllable, and it's, it's tolerable to the point of where we've developed, we've developed the opportunity to be our own resilient factor or have that support system around us that helps us with that resiliency. So, you know, I call my mom and have her help me out with something that came up. I've built that support system. Whereas if we look on the left side, you know, it's unpredictable stress. It's extreme stress, global pandemic, homelessness, um, hunger, and prolonged 
you know, it, it becomes to the point of where these children and their families are extremely vulnerable. So here is another video, I believe this is from Harvard, and it talks about basically how stress affects us and then what we can actually do about it. We all want to give our children what they need to grow to their full potential. And as parents, we play an important role in their development. But our parenting is affected by the supports and challenges in our lives, including experiences that cause what's known as toxic stress. Stress is called toxic when it doesn't let up. And there aren't supportive relationships to help us cope. That can make it hard to get through the day, let alone be the best caregivers we can be. The overwhelming burden of toxic stress can affect the health and well-being of adults. It can also affect the development of children in ways that can last a lifetime. Stress that puts us in a constant state of fight or flight can make it feel like we're always on edge or like it's impossible to calm down. And these feelings can overload our ability to provide the supportive relationships that children need in order to thrive. Toxic stress is heavy cargo. Just as a truck can only haul so much weight before it stops moving forward, challenging life circumstances like losing a job or not having a place to live can weigh us down. And just as a truck can break down if it carries too much for too long, we too can wear down from being overburdened without the support we need. When toxic stress is related to things we can't control, like poverty, abuse, or racism, it can feel especially heavy to take on. But experiencing toxic stress doesn't have to determine who we are or how we act. And understanding how stress affects us can empower us to make change in our lives. There are things we can do to buffer ourselves and our children against the effects of even the most intense stress. Just as redistributing cargo from an overloaded truck can help it run again, supports and services, things like food pantries, job training programs, or even just talking with someone who cares can help us focus on caring for ourselves and our children. And just as regular maintenance is required to keep a truck running, reliable access to community services can help us manage the load during challenging times. Reaching out to get support can be difficult. But things that might seem very small, like sitting and breathing deeply, playing I spy with your child, or even sharing a walk or a snuggle can make a difference. Over time, these small steps can build our resilience and our children's by strengthening the skills and relationships that help us cope. And our communities can build resilience too by providing services and opportunities that help all families thrive. Supports like these help build a strong foundation for developing brain architecture. So the earlier we can provide them, the better. But the brain is capable of change throughout life, and it's never too late for a tune-up. Coping with and healing from toxic stress takes a lot of effort and support. But we all need the help of others in difficult times. And building resilience and strength in our families and communities is one of the most important investments we can make as a society. In the end, it will help all of us become the parents that we want to be. So as we move on to more of our, our trends in trauma, um, as, as we talk about historical and intergenerational trauma, um, I do need to acknowledge the fact that I am a Caucasian woman, where I am speaking on this purely from what I have learned. Um, so I have a video following this from individuals who know a lot more than I do about this. But what I would like to say is, um, you know, we cannot talk about trauma without acknowledging the fact 
that there is centuries of trauma that have occurred not only in our country, but in our world. And, you know, putting it simply, uh, basically the idea that generations of people who are enslaved, disenfranchised, murdered, persecuted, stripped of language and culture are affected by these experiences and their actual adaptive response is often passed down from one generation to the next. So I'm going to jump to um, a video here. What matters in life is not what happens to you, but what you remember and how you remember it. My dad said when they were growing up, they said, we used to play cowboys and Indians. And he started telling me this story. And we used to fight over, uh, nobody wanted to be the Indian. And he said, I didn't think about that. We'd all play and I'd always suck it up and I'd be the Indian. But how ironic is it for a bunch of Indian children to be playing cowboys and Indians and nobody wants to be the Indian? The introduction of a destruction of culture and loss of what is good. And, and I asked my dad, well, why didn't anybody want to be the Indian? And I thought I knew the answer. He said, because everybody knows the Indian dies. And that already in his generation, as strong as he was, he received a message as a young child. I received the same message that it was not good to be Indian. Slavery, colonization, forced relocation, and other historically traumatic events in generations past have lingering and profound consequences today. But what is historical trauma? Historical trauma has to do with collective, cumulative emotional wounding over and across generations that results from massive cataclysmic events. These are events that don't just target an individual, but they target a whole collective community. Things like forced relocation from traditional homes lands like the Trail of Tears like my ancestors went through. But the process that our communities talk a lot about is that the trauma is held personally and it's and can be transmitted over generations. So even family members who have not had a direct experience of the trauma itself can feel the effects of that event generations later. Does historical trauma only affect certain groups of people? What really helps me to help people understand the notion of historical trauma is that it's actually a phenomenon that lots of communities, indigenous communities, or people all over the world have sort of kind of um, struggled with. It's not something that specifically is only owned by tribal people or indigenous people. It gets um, um, articulated all over the world. Historical trauma is widespread, affecting many communities across the globe. Observation has, uh, from the empirical side, started with um, work on the Holocaust survivors. And there's a lot of work on intergenerational transmission of trauma. And, um, and it's moved into also looking at Japanese internment survivors, Armenian survivors, descendants of the Holo their, their Holocaust, and so forth. So there's been some more, some, some more empirical work in this area. And you can imagine trying to track trauma over generations and trying to tease out what is the impact over generations on this child combined with whatever traumatic events they've gone through in their, their childhood and their, in their lifetime. Historical trauma is passed on across generations. Well, I say to you, acknowledgement is due my grandfather, Pop. He never told us the stories of why he did certain things. He never shared with us why he never cried, for example. He never shared with us why he walked out the door when my grandmother cried. Why he turned his back when she cried. Of course we thought he turned his back because he didn't care, of course. But he turned his back as I look back now because the pain has no words. I still have the images, the images of him dealing with the limitations that he was up against. I can only imagine the pain. But what I do know is that it didn't go away. It came inside into those of us who followed him. No one ever talks about the moment you found out that you were white or the moment you found out that you were black. That's a profound revelation. The minute you find that out, something happens. 
you have to renegotiate everything, and that's a profound psychological moment. I saw a water fountain that said white in color. My family was seven kids by then. We drank a lot of Kool-Aid. So colored water, that was in my cognitive schema. So I go toward this colored water fountain, and while I'm there, just before I get there, there's a little white girl who saw the same colored water fountain, and she was just about to turn the sprocket when her mother came and grabbed her by the arm. And she said, you cannot drink from that colored water fountain. And she said, but I want the colored water. I want the colored water. Oh, I want the colored water. So I knew it must be good. So I run to the colored water fountain, looking for my mom, making sure she won't stop me from drinking. And I turned the water fountain, and it was clear, just like at home. That day, that trauma, I remember to this moment. For African American communities, historical identity and understanding is inextricably tied to the reality of enslavement. It ties us to enslavement with what an awful terror. 400 years of trauma we experienced, and for us we talk about it as being utter cultural erasure. So in the beginning, I mentioned that the training this is adapted from is called the Seven Essential Ingredients, and the, the acronym for it is 7EI. And this is basically our framework for understanding trauma, breaking down trauma, and um, so it's, you know, an appreciation for the prevalence of trauma and the impact and it creates an opportunity for us to shift our perspectives and think differently about us personally about our clients about our loved ones and once you get there once we get there the regulation relationship and reason to be become clear in the healing process and then we start to we start to understand that the primary tool in trauma informed care is the caregiver is the professional and that requires us as caregivers and professionals to bring our best every day so because this is such an enormous training I pulled some components from the ingredients. We're not going to go through all of them, but I highlighted what I felt was important and what was relevant for our network today as we talk about what is relevant to us in regards to trauma. You know, one of the elements that can actually diminish our capacity, our ability, is the exposure to others' trauma and their pain and suffering. So when our ability to respond becomes so overwhelming um, and it starts to create difficulty in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, we look at this, these signs that trauma may be impacting us. Have we become emotionally numb? Are we on edge or agitated? Could we even be withdrawn? You know, the inability to concentrate, the poor short-term memory, um, our impaired immune system, and even not willing to talk about it. Maybe, you know, people won't understand. I'm not going to talk about it. Many of these are warning signs that we are experiencing secondary trauma. Um, there's a study that, that has shown that the prevalence of secondary trauma in child welfare settings can be as high as 33% at any given time. So it's important to know what the signs of secondary trauma are and to seek help 
um, maybe from your advocate supervisor, from a loved one, you know, make sure that you have that resiliency and that support system with you to help you through some of these things. So, you know, if as we see some of these secondary trauma signs, um, is it just secondary trauma or could it be more? We've learned that our ability to effectively advocate for these children is impacted by more than just secondary trauma. So much like the trauma field has learned that developmental trauma is a, a different concept than like post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, some examples that were given to me as part of this training was there was a St. A staff member that was called to the scene of a suicide and witnessed a individual hanging from a tree. So this is an example of a job-related primary trauma. Um, St. A also had staff called to a, re um, a residential home and they saw a residential client being restrained by police and watched the client's struggle to resist. Um, so that's vicarious trauma. And in this scenario, that staff member, it triggered a memory of her own personal trauma. She was restrained by medical staff in a hospital. And that happened on her fourth late night shift in a row, which leads to burnout. There was also um, staff that was involved in pretty difficult child welfare outcomes where children have actually passed away or been seriously injured. Um, and those individuals were called baby killers. Um, they were threatened on social media. So there's definitely, when it comes to children and when it comes to some pretty tough scenarios, staff members um, can be under, under a lot of stress and media unfortunately plays into that. Um, you know, and then we continuously make sure that as supervisors or professionals or administrators in systems try to provide resiliency and support. Um, and unfortunately, there still are some systems that kind of just leave you out there hanging that, you know, you really kind of have to deal with it on your own type of thing. So having a more thorough understanding of capacity, of our ability to advocate for these children involves all of these different scenarios and possibly their potential crossover or even coexistence at one time. So here's another perspective. Um, this is something that when I saw this data, I, was, I, I wasn't necessarily shocked, but it kind of reiterated what I thought I already knew. Um, so here's a slide that it offers some perspective on primary trauma history that staff brings with them to the job. So, you know, in our scenario, it could be CASA advocates, it could be CASA staff, program staff, it could be anybody involved in the organizations, it could be board members. Um, this is not a a very specific snapshot of um, certain job titles, I would say. This is representative of child welfare staff in the red bars compared to original numbers of just general ACE score surveys. So the number of child welfare staff 
who reported four or more ACEs is nearly double the original of general ACE study respondents. So, you know, ACEs offer perspective on individuals' trauma exposure, not necessarily, not necessarily their trauma response. Um, but with that being said, it's pretty clear that staff in many helping professions actually bring a primary trauma history to their work, which has the potential to bring both strengths and challenges to the work. So to put a little personal spin on this, um, you know, I don't know if I would necessarily be working for CASA if I didn't grow up with siblings that were in foster care and were adopted. I was exposed to this world at such a young age and with that comes, I did have primary trauma exposure. And now it brings me to this line of work. So this is, this was kind of a, a light bulb for me on a personal level, on a professional level. And I, I kind of want you to sit with it for a little bit because, um, you know, as, as volunteers, as staff, we do own part of our exposures and responses when we were younger and maybe it, that are current. So I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Um, this is a, this, this kind of shows what trust and resiliency can provide to these children. Uh, it's a really phenomenal video and not necessarily identify yourself as parents of these kids or foster parents of the children that you work with, but recognize that as CASAs, as staff members, we can play an important role in what is outlined here. <laughs> TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention, has at its core building a trusting relationship. It has three sets of principles, and they look at the child as a whole. When you think about development, the baby cries, and I say, yes, I will comfort you. And so this child learns that they have a voice. They learn trust, which is the lesson of the first year of life. I can trust. There are so many children from hard places, and for those children, their capacity to trust has been fiercely damaged. The brain chemistry of a child who cries and no one comes is dramatically altered. The child with a history of trauma or loss or abuse has no hope of healing without a nurturing relationship. In every way that I make time and space, that I give touch, eye contact, and I give words, I am going to empower this child to go back to the beginning of what he or she should have experienced in the arms of a loving parent that said, when you cry, I will come. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, as we connect to this child, as we build safety, we actually change the brain chemistry. We change the wiring of the brain. This is really the heart and soul of all that we are and all that we do. Do I look into the child's eyes? Do I touch their arm when I talk to them? When they talk to me, do I stop what I'm doing and talk to them? This is the essence of mindfulness. The excitatory chemicals about, I'm afraid, I'm hungry, I'm cold, those are balanced when the caregiver comes and gives warmth. All regulation occurs first with an external regulator. So in the beginning, I regulate all. They're cold, I bring warmth. They're crying, I bring myself. And out of my regulation, their brain develops capacity for self-regulation. 
if this child didn't have this experience. That child doesn't feel safe. This chemistry can be altered, first by knowing they're safe, second by nutrient-rich foods, third by my environmental regulation of that child's emotion, and fourth by appropriate exercise. So we can balance brain chemistry by creating a holistic environment. We clearly have to deal with behavior. Correcting means showing a child the right behavior, praising him when he gets it, and showing it to him until he can get it right, and showing him with no fear and no shame so that he builds success, not a greater sense of failure. So the message of hope for our families is that we can help our children to dramatic levels of healing. We simply have to be devoted to it and be willing to invest what it's going to take. So this speaks on as caregivers, how can we help our children build those trusting bonds and have that resiliency moving forward. Um, so something that I'm going to jump back here. Um, you know, when we talk about perspective, I think many of us in, because we are here, because we have this passion, we recognize that we do look at life through our own personal lenses. We look at life based off of our own experiences. And sometimes that can be at the detriment of ourselves. Sometimes that can be at the detriment of others. And sometimes both. Sometimes at the, you know, simultaneously you can be hurting yourself and hurting others based off of your perspectives. Um, so just a quick little story. Uh, kind of a personal touch and I'll preface this with saying as a human I know that I will continue to evolve um, I'm making an I'm being pretty vulnerable right now because a story that I'm going to share puts me in a position where I was kind of a insert expletive human I was looking at life through my own lens and I wasn't taking into account another person's experiences. Um, so please give me a little, uh, I have evolved since, since this incident, but it was a profound moment for me because when I was working corporate, um, I actually started working part-time at a local homeless shelter because I did have that underlying desire to help others. It was a homeless shelter that specifically served um, young moms, which I don't know if many of you know, probably none of you know, I had a child very young. So it was something that I identified with and I feel like I've evolved from and quote unquote made it. Um, I wanted to help other women who are going through similar experiences that I went through. Um, and it was a weekend uh, before my first shift. I was actually grocery shopping with my son and I turned the corner on the grocery aisle and saw this mom and two kids. Um, mom and two kids were not dressed what I would consider well. Please forgive me, this is who I used to be. Um, what I would not consider well. They had some shaggy clothing. Um, the shoes looked like they didn't fit. You know, when we passed them, there was an odor. And Fortunately, my son didn't really say anything, but as I thought to myself in my head, you know, I was almost mom shaming her because of what she looked like and what she smelled like. You know, how oftentimes we judge other people because of our own experiences. So, you know, we checked out, went on with our lives. I showed up to my first shift. I opened the front door of the shelter and she and her two children were right there. So um, you want to talk about perspective shift? 
that was a huge eye-opening experience for me because I recognize now based off of my own insecurities and experiences that I was projecting a whole lot onto that mom and those two children that was unfair, that was disrespectful, and was just outright mean. So transitioning into perspectives, um, you know, when, when we talk about children, you know, this is not this is not the funny memes on social media. This is conversations that children are hearing. These are words that we are using. Um, when we look at the traditional view, so this is the left column, we're, we're saying that kids are acting out. They have anger management issues. They're naughty. They're manipulative. They can't be controlled. They can never stay on task. They never pay attention. And they're always pushing buttons. And then, you know, even to motivate these children that they have to have consequences. Well, if we take a step back and look at actions of children through a holistic trauma-informed perspective, we would see that they're not acting out they're emotionally dysregulated. They don't have anger management problems. They're scared. So they're having a fight response. They could be having a flight response or they could be having a freeze response. They're not naughty. These are the behaviors that they've learned and adapted to on how to cope. They're not manipulative. They're trying to get their needs met. They're not controllable, or they're not not, I guess, double negatives. They're not uncontrollable. They're in need of some skills and mentorship on how to self-regulate. And they're not off task. They're not not paying attention. They're hypervigilant. And these are adaptations that they have learned. They're not pushing buttons. They have a negative template. They have a, a worldview that is different than many of ours. And then they're not in need of consequences to motivate. They're in need of help from us to heal. So when we look at, you know, the, the perception of children, oftentimes it's much easier for us to shift our perspectives from that traditional view to the trauma-informed view. Because we view children as, you know, innocent and needing to be helped. Well, what happens when we turn it to adults? How do we view adults? In the traditional context, they're non-compliant, when in reality, they're scared or they're seeking control because they haven't had control in their lives. They're not lazy, they're feeling helpless. They don't, they don't not care, they're not disengaged, they're overwhelmed, they're not manipulative, they're too seeking to get their needs met. I mean, they're not angry, these are adaptations that they have learned in order to survive. They're not delayed or slow, they're dissociative. And they don't have a system distrust. They've experienced and continue to experience historical trauma. So our beliefs, our feelings, are what have to change for our perspective to change. So when we go back to, you know, this traditional view versus the trauma-informed view, some of these are pretty difficult to transition from one to the other. But we have to, in order to help these children and young adults and adults. So I'll leave you with this last video. Um, and then we'll we'll have a Q and A after. I want to 
to show you the power of social emotional support. <clears throat> in our behavior risk factor surveillance system, we ask, how often do you get your social emotional needs met? And uh, they answer rarely or never, sometimes or always or usually. The blue bar is always or usually. And these are stress-related diseases, the first one being cardiovascular, the middle diabetes, and the right treatment for mental illness. And you can see that people who always or usually have their social emotional support needs have less stress-related car disease, cardiovascular diabetes, and treatment for mental illness. And we know that that's uh, the treatment for mental illness is also aligned with mental illness symptoms because we also added the Kessler scale, which is a symptom scale, to our BRFIS, and we could check against it. So actually creating social emotional support is something we can all do in our work, in our daily lives, we can think more in terms of group, networks of relationships, how do we offer opportunity in that way. And finally, what builds community? So we found four variables that are very, very important. One is leadership expansion. What I mean is everyone who wants to help is a leader. So making space for more people across the uh, economic lines, across cultural lines, et cetera, to give and help is a really powerful act. Coming together and talking about issues that actually matter to people and not having agendas that are full of administrative gobbledygook, but really actually calling the question that's in the room is actually a very powerful act, especially if you take care to develop a room that has a lot of emotional safety, physical safety, moral safety. Learning together is actually really powerful in building community. When we learn together, we shift our sense of self. We become a we, uh, and that's very powerful. And learning together also naturally leads to reciprocity. Because if I'm learning with you, and I know that, oh, you're in a class and you need that book, I have it. I could give it to you, I already read it, right? Because we're in a learning mode, we learn about each other too, and what will help our lives. And last, making decisions from the future we actually want to live in. Um, and Liz is going to talk more about that dynamic in terms of collective impact. So these four create a virtuous reinforcing cycle. When you get into this cycle, communities just won't quit. It's impressive to see. They just keep calling themselves together to talk about issues that matter and learning together and making decisions about their future. And that's really what we want, right? So I want to show you a little bit in closing about the power of community capacity. The blue bars are places that scored very high on those four factors. Um, and the gold bars are score, are communities that either aren't getting together regularly to build capacity or scored very low over time. And you can see that we have much lower rates of serious mental illness, much lower rates of um, severe depression, and much lower rates of depression. And higher community capacity scores are correlated with higher percentage of people getting a post-high school education. You can see the bars go up as the capacity scores go up. Um, with a larger percentage of people employed, the bar is going up as the capacity scores go up. Um, we made um, an index out of three of the resilience questions that we added to the BRFIS, a hope, positive view of one's life, and social emotional support. And we can see that having those things in your life actually helps with housing stability. Family, the adults that reported high rates of support, positive view, and hope were much less likely to be moving four times or more in the last year. And especially for young children, that really matters because each move probably comes with a different caregiver, a different set of relationships. And then what's prompting four or more moves a year? There could be stress involved in whatever's prompting it. So in summary, we learn about trauma, we learn about resilience, um, that there are seven essential ingredients to trauma-informed care, and then recognizing that our own perspectives play into our advocacy and our ability to provide services for these children and families. And then one thing that I wanted to mention is 
because this was so information heavy and because we had about an hour, I will be providing a handout for you on ideas of how to process trauma. So this could be for you, this could be for a loved one, it could be for a friend, it could be for somebody that you want to help process their trauma. Uh, that'll be coming in the email tomorrow morning. And then I just want to say thank you so, so much for being here and uh, giving me an hour and a half of your night. I know that there's a lot of webinars that you could be participating in and we're very grateful that you're here. So I am going to now stop the recording and I will be going live with the questions that you have been putting into the chat box. If you do have any questions that you have not put in the chat box yet, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, you will have my contact information and can ask any further questions um, via email. So thank you and I will see you live soon. Hello. Oh gosh. <clears throat> All right. So I was going through the chat box and I saw that many of you really wanted to um, learn about what kind of behaviors children exert when they experience trauma. So I'm going to briefly touch on, on that tonight. But what I will say is I'm going to be putting out a lot more trainings because um, this initial set of seven essential ingredients is actually almost like an eight to 10 hour training. So I really tried to condense it down and it was almost me making a case for trauma informed living and trauma informed care is just so essential. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to say about that. But then the other thing is, this is being recorded. Um, we will be posting it on our website. So you will be able to share it with your networks. You can watch it again. Um, and then as an attendee, you know, you can, uh, you'll get all the resources and everything tomorrow. So I'm going to share my screen again here and just briefly go through those classic trauma symptoms of children. And what I wanted to say is you heard, um, you heard me say dissociative a lot. And what I'm actually going to do is show you this slide first because I feel like it gives you a really good visual of what arousal is and what dissociative is. So these are definitely clinical terms, but what I want you guys to know is, you know, when we think about a child who's experiencing trauma or experiencing adversity, we typically think that they are going to act out. They're going to be loud and boisterous, when in reality, that necessarily isn't the response that every child will have. Some of those children will become dissociative. They will withdraw. So I'm gonna jump back to these classic trauma symptoms. Um, I won't read through all of these, but for many of you who asked about those kind of stereotypical symptoms, this would be a good slide to take a screenshot of, or um, you can get it tomorrow morning as well. But, you know, they could be having re-experiencing symptoms. They could be having flashbacks. That's why, you know, sometimes children are afraid to go to sleep because they have those bad dreams. They have those flashbacks. Um, it, it's those, those dark times, um, you know, and uh, avoiding places. I will say that, um, and this initially wasn't going to be part of the presentation, but we as a state organization offer um, rolling suitcases filled with items for children who are removed from their homes initially. Um, it's called My Stuff, My Bag. And we didn't really know how it was going to be received. We 
we got a email from a foster mom and I'm going to be really, I'm going to try and not cry here because it was so powerful. She said the young man that came into her home through foster care received one of those suitcases and it was a lifeline for him because every amount of clothing and every personal item that he came with reminded him of the abuse that he had endured in his family of origin. So you think about it. You, you leave your home and you pack your toothbrush when you're on vacation. You, you, know, you have your, your favorite clothing. Sometimes something so seemingly simple can be triggering for these children. So, you know, staying away from those belongings, those places, those experiences, those are classic symptoms of a child who has experienced trauma. So when we look at arousal signs, so, you know, I envision, because I'm such a visual person, I envision arousal as that Hulk you know, they're, they're increased, they're just agitated. They sometimes become impulsive, they become defiant. They could show more aggression or anxiety. So all of these are, are clinical signs of arousal for children who've experienced trauma. Um, I will say that this is not just for children. Um, this is certainly for any age group that has experienced trauma. And then we jump to those dissociative signs. So that, that typical withdrawal, you know, being, being more so on the quiet side, maybe spacing out a little bit. Um, you know, then there's the, the clinical signs of, you know, eye blinking and rolling, their eye rolling. So all of these are you know, those, those instances of trauma. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and jump into the chat quick. Um, so I think most of the other questions will probably be answered in the resources that I'm putting out tomorrow. Um, the other thing is, you know, and I'm teasing you here, is a lot of these will be put into further trainings. Um, so I'm going to probably end here. I know that there's um, just a few minutes left. But if you, if you have any questions, you will have my email address uh, tomorrow when I send out the handouts. And, you know, thank you so, so much for attending. I really appreciate your time. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.